Good evening and welcome to tonight's talk as we look ahead to Palm Sunday this weekend and the beginning of Holy Week in the company of Archbishop Leo Cushley. My name is Matt Mead. I'm the Communications Officer for the Archdiocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh. Tonight's talk will last no longer than one hour and there will be a chance for questions at the end. You can submit them at any time during the webinar using the Q&A button. But let's get straight into it and welcome our guest. Good evening, Archbishop Leo. Good evening, Matt. Uh, my dear friends, good evening. Thanks very much for joining me for this session. So we're going to go straight into it. How do we get to Palm Sunday? Well, as you know, Lent is 40 days, and it's 40 days in the desert where we are formed by the Word and formed by being in the presence of the Word, our Lord himself. And it's different for three different groups in the church. So first of all, we've got the elect. The elect are those who, on the first Sunday of Lent, said that they would, they would promise to get ready for, for baptism. And those who are already baptized, who want to be Catholics are for being welcomed into the Catholic Church. So they are the elect and the candidates we call the, the second group. So that's the first group that Lent is aimed at. For penitence, it's a time of penance now. We are used to going to confession and receiving a penance and absolution, and then we go and complete the penance. But in former times, penitents received their penance, then completed it during Lent, and then they were absolved at the very end of Lent and rejoined the church. And that's in one period. There are different periods and it happened in different ways. But that is another reason for having Lent the way it is. And then for the rest of us, if you don't fall into either of those categories, you're just one of the Christians that's there in church on a Sunday. We accompany them actively through our own fasting and prayer. And we are reminded of our own journey towards baptism and towards belonging to the, the, the mystical body of Christ or through an important moment in our lives when we were distant from the church and, and regained our communion with the church, we accompany them actively. And so for all of these groups, this means preparing to offer, us, offer with a pure heart the great sacrifice that is at the heart of this, the death and resurrection of the Lord, recalled solemnly at the end of Holy Week in what we call the Triduum, the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, those three days as one action. <clears throat> and all of us prepare to enter into the sacred mystery of our salvation as a result in those three days. So this year we're particularly fortunate because, as you know, the readings of the lectionary um, come in three years. And year A is the year when we listen to the readings that are the most traditional and effective in telling us about this journey into baptism and into joining the Lord in death so that we can rise with him. And so we listen to the story um, of the Samaritan woman, the man born blind, and Lazarus raised from the dead. That's over the third and fourth and fifth Sundays of Lent. And so yesterday we just heard about Lazarus. So if we go to the Samaritan woman, why have these three readings been chosen? Because they've been chosen very specially for those who are getting ready to be baptized, to become members of the church. The Samaritan woman, well, she's a foreigner. She's a Samaritan. She doesn't belong to the Jewish people. And the Jews and the Samaritans didn't associate with each other. She was obviously, she was a woman. She was female. And Jesus meeting her alone in the middle of the day would have been unheard of. It would have been something that, that just wasn't, wasn't done because it could have been suspicious and difficult. But Jesus meets her and is, is, is prepared to meet her quite, quite cheerfully, it would appear. We then discover that there's even more that's kind of at question in her life, that she is divorced. Not only that she's been divorced, she's been married many times. But having said that, she's put at her ease and she's not afraid to start asking Jesus questions. And he dialogues with her. And she is persuaded to bring others in the village to, to meet him. 
And importantly, he goes and he stays with them. Him, a teacher in Israel, goes to stay with them, even though for all these reasons, she and her people are so distant, as it were, from Jesus. Nevertheless, he goes to stay with them and they come to believe him. They become to believe in him, rather. And that's, that's, that's the first big thing that we're learning as we're getting close to Easter, that salvation is there for anyone. Then we have the example of the man born blind, again taken from the Gospel of St. John, and that's on the fourth Sunday of Lent. <clears throat> and in the story, we learn, we learn the attitude towards him, that the Jews refer to him as a sinner through and through. That's because he was born blind. And they considered that blindness, if you were, have been born blind, it means that somewhere in your ancestors, your mother, your father, wherever it may be, that God has somehow cursed you, that you are imperfect by God's will, that somehow there's just something wrong with you and it's probably due to sin. So they consider him because of his blindness to be a sinner born through and through. We know it's a lifelong ailment. We know that the blindness part of it is interesting too to all of the gospels because of course we can see that he, as he grows in his faith, becomes the only person to be able to see who Jesus really is among all these people who are sighted. And the authorities object to this man and they push him away, they drive him away, John says. And yet he is the one, when he finally finds out who it was, because he couldn't see who it was at first, that it was Jesus and that it's this controversial figure. He comes to believe and John tells us that he worships him. And of course you can hear that. This is a term that is only used with re reference to God or to, in this case, the Son of God. And so as a second element of this, this journey towards faith, that it is open to people who, even if their culture considers them to be sinners through and through, they are approached by Jesus, they are healed by Jesus, and that you too can come to believe and to worship Jesus. And then the third story is the one of Lazarus, the one that we heard in church yesterday at Mass. Lazarus is a young man. He is a friend of Jesus in life. And we, we meet him later on. He comes to a banquet after this as well. We know that he's been dead four days, which means past three days, which symbolically and even technically means that we are pretty sure you're dead after three days, but you're not only dead, but then some, if it's four days. So we know that he is dead. And yet, through an expression of faith, the Lord intervenes and brings him to life. And it's interesting that the expression of faith is from his sister. It's not from Lazarus. We don't know what Lazarus thinks or believes, but Martha makes this wonderful declaration which is very similar to the one made by Peter in Caesarea Philippi. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And she says this in John's gospel. It's not Peter that says it, Martha says it. And yet that expression of faith is part of the story of Lazarus being brought back, being summoned by name from death. And not only that, not only does the Lord command people who are dead to be raised to life. In the story, in John's gospel, this becomes the very reason that Jesus must die. And it is put into the, into the mouth of the high priest that Jesus must die for the people. And John comments, not only for all the people, but for all the scattered children of God. And that means you and me, that means all of us. So a wonderful story, a positive story, and a very encouraging one. So far then, no matter our sins and our compromised relationships, no matter how persistent our state of life or things that are beyond our control, no matter if we're even dead and buried, Jesus calls all of us out of sin and incompleteness and death. And Jesus calls all of us to new life in him with sin and death put behind us. So that's the preparation. That's Lent 
until we get now to Holy Week. Holy Week, before we, we get into the meat of Holy Week, there are a couple of things that we ought to understand about it. Two words that you may be familiar with in Greek are chronos and kairos, and they both mean time, but they mean time in two different ways. Chronos is like a long period of time, like the season of Lent, but kairos is a moment in time. And these two things are going to be important, that Lent is like a time to grow and to develop, but points in time, the kairos, are like moments, and they're moments for decision and for action. And so Lent is a bit like a chronos, but when we get to the freedom, it becomes a moment, it becomes a key moment for decision and for action. There are two other words that we need to keep in mind and two other concepts that come to us from the ancients. And one of them is anamnesis, which is Greek, and the other one is hodie, Latin, for today. And the anamnesis is about recalling before the presence of Almighty God the important deeds that God has done. And by doing so solemnly before God, we make them present not only before him again, but before us as well. And so anamnetic prayer, as it's called, is something that is very deep in Jewish prayer and in Christian prayer, that the Jews would say, Lord our God, the God of the universe, you saved us from, from slavery in Egypt, do it again in our day. That is anamnetic prayer, that we recall the great events we make them present before the Lord and we say, do the same for us in our day. And we do that most solemnly as a church in the assembly. And if we do it at the most sacred time of the year, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, it means, my friends, that we are recalling those events. We are making them real and present before God and before us and not only that, we make them effective. And I'm going to explain how we make them effective as we go along. In those three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the church looks at them as one action, one big, long celebration. Even though we go home for our tea, and go to our beds, and we all come back the next day, it's all meant to be seen and felt and thought about as one action. So one way, the one way that we normally refer to it is as the Triduum Sacrum, which is, uh, we find that ref referenced in St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, the, the man that he baptized and brought into the church. So St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan at the end of the fourth century, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo at the same time. And these two great men refer to it in their writings as the Triduum Sacrum. So that's the sacred Triduum, the sacred three days in one. We don't quite have a word for it, but I'm sure you get the picture. A few years later, just a couple of decades later, 440, we have Pope St. Leo the Great, who refers to this time as the Pascale Sacramentum. You can see that as Paschal Sacrament, the Easter Sacrament. When And Pascale, Easter, easy, straightforward. Sacrament is a word that we're familiar with, here it means what it used to mean back in ancient times, which was a guarantee, a pledge. It was a way of throwing the, the, the sign, the sign and the reality together. And, and so what we do is we bring together the, the mystery of the Lord descending into death and rising to new life. And we bring that together with baptism and confirmation and Eucharist and make it effective. So Pascale Sacramentum is another wonderful way to describe it. And that breaks down into the three moments that we know already. The Lord's Supper, the Passion of the Lord on Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil, the celebration of the Lord's empty tomb. But it is all of it one great celebration of the Lord's victory on the cross. To give you an idea of what that's like, I've taken four little bits of prayers from across those three days. 
And just to, just to let you see how they all work together, they are all doing exactly the same thing. But what I want you to do is, I want you to guess which of the three days the following comes from. Grant that, just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature, the image of the man on earth, so by the sanctification of grace, we may bear the image of the man in heaven. I wonder what that feels like. Does that feel like Thursday or Friday or Saturday? Well, it turns out that is the opening prayer from Good Friday. When you see it standing on its own, it's curious that it doesn't quite sound like it's just about Good Friday, does it? It sounds like it's broader than that. Here's another one. Grant, we pray, that we may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and life. Well, that, my friends, comes from the Lord's Supper. That is the part of the opening prayer of the Lord's Supper. Perhaps charity, caritas, gives us a way of seeing where this is going. But again, you could use that prayer on any of these three days. Here's another one. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast with the unleavened bread of purity and truth. Well, this comes from the Easter Vigil. It's the communion antiphon. But could it have been Friday? It could have. Could it have been Thursday? I think it could have. You would have been forgiven for expecting it to be in Holy Thursday. And here's the final one. Almighty ever-living God, who restored to us, who restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. Well, I don't know if you think that that should have been at the Easter Vigil, but there you are, it's Good Friday, and it's the prayer after communion, but there we are with the the resurrection of the Lord being mentioned. So I hope I've illustrated that the three things, they go, they kind of go together and they do overlap in their concepts. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a look at the Easter Vigil, then Good Friday, then Holy Thursday, and then go back to Palm Sunday and finish at Palm Sunday, what we're, what we're looking at here. But we'll do it in reverse order. So a quick tour of the Easter Vigil. Well, the Easter Vigil is it's a dies non, as we sometimes say, even importing that into English. It's a day when nothing's meant to be happening, nothing except this. This is the absolute summit of the year. We have certain things that have been imported from various places, the Easter fire, which is something that comes from the Celtic world, so we should be quite pleased with that. And it should encourage us to make a nice big Easter fire. Not that I think I've been to any church in my 40 years of priesthood, but there's been a particularly big Easter fire. But anyway, then we have the Easter candle, which is a separate, a separate uh, tradition. We also have the proclamation of the resurrection, which is also known as the Exultet. It's very old, fourth century. Um, we do have people like the great St. Ambrose, the great St. Jerome, um, taking sides on whether or not they really like the, the quality of the, the writing. But that's beside the point. We do have it still, and, and most people like to hear it. Then we have the readings. The readings take us from creation all the way through the Red Sea and sin and redemption and references to water and the spirit and pointing us towards the, the font of baptism and what's going to come with the empty tomb. And then finally, the gospel of the empty tomb itself. There's also after that, there's the blessing of, of the waters of life. St. Hippolytus tells us that this is the, the start of the third century, that they waited till cock crow. So they've been praying all the way through the night. And just as the sun comes up, they all face towards the dawn and they bless the waters. We also hear um, the creed as it's meant to be at baptism, where Satan is denied three times and the faith is embraced in Father and Son and Holy Spirit with the threefold pouring of water or even immersion in a pool, if you happen to have a pool or a big river handy. And after that, uh, confirmation, because now that we have been purified and joined the Lord in death, we are 
temples of the Holy Spirit, purified and ready and waiting for the indwelling gift of God's Holy Spirit to live within us. And after that, we say the Our Father together. We, we, we give each other the sign of peace, which we should always remember is not simply a friendly wee handshake or a nod to each other as we do these days. It is meant to be the kiss of peace between brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the redeemed. It's something much more important than the wee nod and the wee friendly kiss that we give to each other. It's much, much more important than that. And then finally, to complete all of that, receiving the Eucharist and for those just baptized that receive into the church, receiving the Lord for the very first time and completing their initiation and their being made members, full members of the mystical body of Christ. Wonderful stuff. So these are, these are things that show us that we have evoked all of this before the Lord. We have recalled it solemnly and made it present among us and then we have made it effective we've made it real by baptizing people and welcoming them into the church and so we have from jerusalem we have uh, an instruction to the newly baptized in the fourth century which runs it runs like this what a strange and astonishing situation we did not really die we were not really buried we did not really hang upon the cross and rise again our imitation was symbolic, but our salvation a reality. That through baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, we imitate the Lord's death and resurrection. We imitate it in symbol, but it becomes reality, my friends, through those sacraments. That's what makes it all so, so wonderful, so important. Taking a step back to Good Friday, Good Friday reflects a very ancient tradition, a very old way of, of being together in church. It is very stark. It looks very simple. The reality is, of course, that Mass used to be very stark and very simple um, in, in many of the ways that we still see in Good Friday, that there is, there is no sign of the cross or greeting or Kyrie's or Gloria's or creeds or anything. It's very, very simple but there is a great beauty about it. It's stark in our eyes because we're used to many more elements in Mass today. But what we see in Good Friday is very stark. And for me, part of it isn't just, it's not the starkness. It's the being faithful to the tradition that is very, very old. And that is the thing to be paid more attention to than the simplicity and the starkness, which is also striking as we know. We discovered uh, a woman called Egeria, who might have been uh, uh, a nun. And in the 19th century, her travel diaries were rediscovered. She went as a pilgrim and a tourist in the fourth century um, in the Mediterranean to the Holy Land. And we have been able to piece together since the, the middle of the 19th century, her travelogue. And it is a wonderful diary and a wonderful um, witness of what, what it was like to travel in the fourth century. And she tells us about the proclamation of the Passion on Good Friday. So that's how, how long we've been doing this, since just after the empire started to become Christian. She tells us about processions to Calvary and to the tomb. She tells us about the veneration of the cross, because St. Helen, as you know, had gone to the site of the crucifixion and she had found wood there that they supposed and hoped was part of the complex upon which our, our Lord was, was crucified. And they venerated this, this relic of the cross and they kept it there for many centuries. And there are still little pieces of that bit of the cross um, here and there in the Christian church. Good Friday today, what does it look like today? Well, the Roman Rite says the following about it. This is what we say about it today. On this and the following day, by a most ancient tradition, the church does not celebrate the sacraments at all, except for penance and anointing of the sick. Secondly, on this day, Holy Communion is distributed to the faithful only within the celebration of the Lord's Passion, but it may be brought at any hour of the day to the sick 
who cannot participate in this celebration. And thirdly, the altar should be completely bare, without a cross, without candles, and without cloths. So a couple of things to note about that. We, we notice that we're, we, we're, not, we're, we're not celebrating any of the other sacraments. It's meant to be an asacramental day. There's not meant to be the celebration of any sacraments, but, but except for penance and the anointing of the sick. But back in the day, back in ancient times, there were no sacraments celebrated at all because the Lord is absent. Grace is absent. And, and they, were, they, were much, they were much harder on themselves. They were much tougher on themselves back in the day. But now we are, we are a little bit weaker. We, we, we allow ourselves the flexibility of doing all of those things. If we continue, we notice as well that Good Friday is meant to be a day as non. It's meant to be um, a day when nothing else is done except this. We always listen to the celebration of the passion of the Lord, um, according to, to John. Um, the liturgy of the word is the suffering servant, of course, as well as the passion of John. And we have the 10 great intercessions. We've actually got written intercessions. Instead of making them up for ourselves with the general guidelines that we normally have, there are 10 great intercessions that we all read everywhere. And what is striking about that is that today of all the days is when we place before Almighty God the sacrifice of his son on the cross. We recall that solemnly and we say to the Lord, Lord, you gave us your son who died for us on the cross. Hear our prayers. And those solemn prayers today of all days are, is the day on which we hope to be heard most keenly by the Lord. We also have the adoration of the Holy Cross. That's like Egeria told us about. We continue to do that to this day. We didn't know about Egeria until the 19th century. And so it's really rather comforting and interesting to know that Egeria confirms this very ancient tradition that we have. And we also receive Holy Communion. And although, as I said, it's an asacramental day, we, we don't fast from the greatest food but there have been times in our history in the past when we did. There was no Holy Communion until it came to the Easter Vigil and the Lord was once again present um, among us in the Eucharist and risen from the dead. Moving back one day more, we come to Holy Thursday, we come to the Lord's Supper. And to give us an idea of what that looks like, the very first words that we utter of the whole three days of that whole sacred triduum are the following from Galatians. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ in whom is our salvation, life and resurrection through whom we are saved and delivered. Isn't that extraordinary? We don't start off on this kind of B minor note and solemnly and darkly because we're anticipating that the Lord is going to be betrayed and scourged and die on the cross, we start instead with this great note of confidence and of victory. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's so positive, it's so powerful, and it should be in our minds and set the tone, because that's what it's doing, that's what it's meant to do, set the tone for the whole three days. When we come to the celebration of the Lord's Supper itself, we have, first of all, the, the Passover of the Lord from the Old Testament. And then to, in the New Testament, of course, we have links to what is going to happen on Calvary. We have what we call the mandatum, which gives us the word Monday, Monday, Thursday. The mandatum, it's the command to love. And from that, the washing of the feet, which by very ancient tradition is the gospel of, of the Lord's Supper's. It, it, the, the Lord's Supper, it's, it, it sounds a little bit strange because we do have the institution of the Eucharist elsewhere, but it's, it just happens to be one of those things in our tradition that on top of listening to that from St. Paul, we use the opportunity at the Gospel to add something more, which is that gesture of love that was misunderstood by the Twelve at the time. And we have the transfer of the Most Blessed Sacrament, um, and, a, and a vigil. Uh, 
moving back another step again in principle holy thursday but it can be celebrated in a couple of days before that and that's the way we do it in edinburgh is that we have the chrism mass so it's still a ds non it's the day in theory anyway uh, that we have the completion of our penances although for those who haven't made it yet they're able to get to confession in the days coming there is met in tradition in the tradition, there was the reconciliation of those doing penances before the bishop and the assembly. Those who had been completing lengthy penances would be absolved in front of the whole church. They would be welcomed back, and therefore the church would be ready to celebrate the Triduum, united, purified, forgiven of all its sins, and, and then be able to welcome the, the Baptist Zandi, those about to be baptized and therefore be able as the people of God, the holy people of God, to offer perfectly the one great sacrifice of Calvary. Other elements around Christ, the Chrism Mass are the, the idea of the, the, the feast of the, the priesthood, that it becomes, it, it became since the 1950s and since Pope Paul VI had, had this wonderful idea that he brought from the Church of Milan, this idea of the renewal of priestly promises and an opportunity for all of you, all of us, to pray for our priests, to pray for the bishop. Um, and a no bad thing for us to be able to renew our commitment to you and for us to be able to, to, to pray with you and for you to pray for us and it's it's always a beautiful moving occasion when all of us i think most priests find very moving very important very beautiful for us to be able to do that so we now come to the, the third section of our talk here and um, where i'm going to look briefly at palm sunday palm sunday is interesting even just the very fact that we call it palm sunday tells us something about it so I'm going, to, I'm going to go through just a couple of lines from Egeria, that woman that I introduced to you there from the fourth century who went as a pilgrim to Jerusalem. And this is what she saw. You don't know where these places are, but they're round about the city of Jerusalem. That's the important thing. And it will give you an idea of what they were doing then and how, for how long we've been doing this. So Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, according to Egeria. At one o'clock, in the afternoon, all the people go up to the Eleona Church on the Mount of Olives. The bishop takes his seat, and then they have hymns and antiphons suitable to the place and the day and readings too. When three o'clock comes, they go up with hymns and sit down at the Imbomon, the place from where the Lord ascended into heaven. For when the bishop is present, everyone is told to sit down except for the deacons. At five o'clock, the passage is read from the gospel about the children who met the Lord with palm branches saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At this, the bishop and all the people rise up from their places and start off on foot down from the summit of the Mount of Olives. All the people go before him with palms, with psalms and antiphons, all the time repeating, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The babies and the ones too young to walk are carried on their parents' shoulders. Everyone is carrying branches, either palm or olive, and they accompany the bishop in the very way the people did when once they went down with the Lord. They go on foot all down the mount to the city and all through the city to the Anastasis. The Anastasis is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But they have to go fairly gently on account of the older women and men among them who might get tired. So it is already late when they reach the Anastasis. But even though it is late, they hold Lucernare, that's the lighting of candles for the evening prayer, when they get there and have a prayer at the cross and the people are dismissed. Now, isn't that interesting? This is, this is the fourth century, that they are already, they're already doing something that is recognisable compared to what we do when it comes to Palm Sunday. And we also note that they use palms or olive branches because they're the branches that they've got to hand. Now that's, that's interesting, but let's remember folks, we are part of the Church of Rome and the Church of Rome at exactly the same time, just a few decades later, we have, we have a very different thing going on on that Sunday 
a week before Easter Sunday. The name of it is Dominicine Palmas de Passione Domini. So you can see that there is a mixture of, of significances, that its, its name is about the, the, the Sunday in Palms concerning the Passion of the Lord. So it's so what is going on? Well, we have the witness of Pope St. Leo the Great, who became Pope in 440. And this is what he says is happening on what we now call Palm Sunday in Rome. How marvellous the power of the cross. How great beyond all telling the glory of the passion. Here is the judgment seat of the Lord, the condemnation of the world, the supremacy of Christ crucified. You see, in Rome, they were listening to the passion. They weren't quite celebrating with processions and palms. They weren't doing that at all. They were concentrating on the passion of the Lord, in spite of the fact that Good Friday hadn't arrived yet, that in Rome, they were doing it slightly differently. Intervening 1600 years, a few things have changed. And so the Roman rites today, what they do in Rome, what Pope Francis does, and what we do too, is a celebration, first of all, of the entry into Jerusalem. So we always start by listening. There are two gospels that day. There's the entry into Jerusalem, later on there's the Passion. So first of all, the entry into Jerusalem. We do it with palms and a procession. When I went abroad to, to Rome to, for my studies, I noticed that almost nobody had palms. They used olive branches. Why? Well, probably because olive branches were more abundant. But both, as we remember from Nigeria, both olive branches and palms were used around the Mediterranean for these things. Then we have a reading from Isaiah. We have a reading from... Philippians, one of the most beautiful from Philippians 2. And then we listen, listen to the Passion of the Lord according to one of the synoptics. This year it will be Matthew because this is year A, next year Mark, the following year Luke. But this is when we listen to it. But in ancient Rome, they would go through Matthew and the next day Mark and the next day Luke. And then they would have a day off. And eventually on Good Friday, there was always St. John. And that's what we do to this day. When we look at the first reading on Palm Sunday, it's Isaiah 50. It's part of the third servant song. I know that you have been studying this with Sister Anna Marie and Father Jamie McMorton, so you'll be familiar with some of this. The idea that the servant listens like a disciple, um, speaks to the weary. Um, it's a scene from the servant's torment. And the Lord he says, he comes to my help and I know I shall not be shaped. And we can figure, we can imagine these, these words very easily in the mouth of our Lord himself. Then Philippians 2 is the second reading. It's Paul's great hymn of Christ's kenosis. Kenosis is a Greek word which refers to him emptying himself of his divinity and allowing himself to be treated as he was. It tells us Paul's understanding of how Jesus existed before all time as the Son of God, in other words, of his divine pre-existence. It tells us of his humility and obedience in the incarnation and as a servant, as we saw in our first reading. It tells us about his humiliation and obedience in death, even death on a cross, says St. Paul, even that, as bad as that. But it also then refers to his his celestial exaltation, but God has raised him high and given the name, given him the name which is above all names, and that is Lord Kurios. That's that's the word that is used to describe the Lord when after the resurrection, and therefore he is adored by the whole of creation. So, therefore, we've got two, this Sunday coming, we've got two bits of St. Matthew to consider. We have his version of the entry into Jerusalem, and then later on we will listen to the passion and death of Jesus um, at length, although there is a slightly shorter version that is sometimes listened to. Matthew himself, well, what do we know about Matthew? Matthew is the name given to the evangelist according to a man called Papias um, by 130 AD that had been established and that there has never really been any reason to doubt that or change that. 
in spite of some scholarship from the from the 19th and early 20th century. We, we continue to refer to it as Matthew's Gospel. We know that he is Ma Matthew the tax collector. We see that in Matthew's own Gospel. We see it elsewhere. We see him called twice, um, and uh, we even see him getting a change of name in St. Mark's Gospel, one that he's fond of, one that he knows, one that he likes to follow quite closely, especially when it comes to the Passion. We believe um, that the gospel was written before 68 AD, and that's according to St. Irenaeus, who's a very reliable and ancient source from the second century. Someone who, back through handshakes and generations, is someone who gets us back um, to St. John, St. John himself, an extraordinary thing. And St. Irenaeus ends up becoming bishop of what is now Lyon in France, very important figure. Matthew knows um, about Jewish practices. We think he was Jewish, but his geography is a little bit shaky. So we're, we're not sure. We think that he, he may not have lived there or may not have lived there for very long because some of the things that he says in his gospel are, are not, quite, not quite correct geographically. He seems to know Aramaic, but his Greek is good. So good for, good for Matthew. Positive one there. And... Referring to him, um, St. John Chrysostom, who's a, a great homilist and important figure, Bishop of Byzantium and Patriarch of Constantinople from the fourth century, refers to his gospel in this way. He says, we, as we go into it, we are entering a golden city. Um, and many saints uh, preferred Matthew's gospel um, and looked to it. I believe that St. Dominic, the founder of Dominicans, carried a copy of St. Matthew's gospel uh, around with him. That was what he carried with him. Um, so the figure of Jesus in Matthew, how does Matthew, how does he see Jesus in particular? Well, like all the evangelists, he believes him to be the son of God. But it's interesting just to pick up on the, the slight emphases that, that Matthew uses. So he starts his gospel by saying, this is about Jesus, the Christ. And there it is, that's what this is about. Um, he also refers to him as the son of God. And that is said by Satan at, at the temptations and by those who are possessed by Peter and his declaration of faith. And by the centurion, when it comes to our Lord's death on the cross, that he says this using what is clearly an ancient Christian declaration of faith that is put in the mouth of the centurion. And, well, I wasn't there. I don't know if the centurion said it or not, but the very formula that he used was the kind of one that was used by the Christians of the earliest times of the church. Jesus is seen by Matthew as someone who fulfills the promises made to Abraham a long time ago. And he is also the new, the great teacher, the new Moses. So his words matter. And it would appear that Matthew has gathered up the information about Jesus into what looks like five great books to, to imitate the Pentateuch that has come down to us as was understood by the ancient Jews and Christians as being from Moses himself and was something definitive and something to be respected in the highest manner. So a couple of notes about the entry into Jerusalem. We notice a few things. We notice that in the short passage that we, we read out, it's not even a whole page for the the procession for the entry into Jerusalem, that Jesus is referred to the master, kurios. And kurios is a word that means Lord, but it also means master, it means owner. And what's interesting is it's one of the rare, rare, rare times before the Lord's resurrection that it is used to describe Jesus. And he uses it to describe himself, which is very interesting. We move on from that. Um, in Matthew, Jesus sits on a donkey and a colt. That's what it says here. It says that he sat on them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt. Then they laid their cloaks on their backs and he sat on them. Well, I don't know how he was going to do that. You can see in the picture just behind the graphic there that they've got the donkey and the colt. And I doubt our Lord attempted to ride on them both. But it's a biblical reference. And people reading this would have understood that. It goes back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that the king who is among the people and is being, who, who, who moves among the lowly, who is there among the lowest people, rides on a donkey and a colt. And this has been picked up by Matthew and put here and is a sign to us all. It says that some spread their cloaks. Well, even, even just the way that, that Raleigh did for Queen Elizabeth I, they've been doing this for centuries. It's the red carpet treatment. It's a way of expressing veneration and respect and welcome to someone, to an honoured guest. And it says here, it says, others cut down branches. And that's all it says in Matthew. In Mark, it's greenery. In Luke, well, Luke doesn't mention it at all. And it's palms in John. And of course, we learn later on that Egeria and those who live in Jerusalem use palms and olive branches, and that then becomes part of our tradition. We then hear Hosanna. I think Hosanna appears in all three accounts. Um, a, a word that simply means save, save we pray, and is associated with, with one, of the, one of the feasts, a week-long feast, incidentally, the Feast of Tents or of Tabernacles from the time of the people in the desert, um, and is a feast of Israel's liberation, which did use palm branches, and that's from Leviticus. So there is, there is something going on here, the, the sense of liberation, the sense of the week long, that this is the start of a week long celebration that will end, that will end with the Lord's death, but it will also end with his resurrection. Moving very briefly on to the Passion in Matthew, because I don't intend my friends to, to treat it in depth. We don't have enough time for that. It's, it's subject for another talk entirely. We notice uh, the Passion in Matthew that we see, as usual, we see Judas, we see the institution of the Eucharist, we see time spent in Gethsemane, um, followed by the arrest of Jesus, as, as we find in the other Gospels. Um, Matthew follows Mark quite closely. In fact, sometimes he doesn't have as much detail as Mark for some reason that, that we, will never, we will never know for certain. We see uh, things like Jesus before the Sanhedrin, before the council, and his claim to be Messiah. And it's very interesting because, and this is something I've been thinking about for a while, that the claim to be Messiah was not a capital offence. In any of the materials that we have from the ancient Jewish world, it was not a capital offence to claim to be the Messiah. But when he does it, even when he does it in a subtle, guarded, careful way, it becomes the reason to destroy him. And it's almost as if they had already decided that this was a man they had to do away with, as we see in the other Gospels, that it almost feels like it didn't matter what Jesus was going to say in his defense or in his claims. There was nothing that was going to save him. But we can also see that with the eyes of faith as being part of the divine plan. But it's interesting to note, nonetheless. He comes before Pilate, as usual. Then we have the death of Judas, which is told at length and in a way that is unique to Matthew compared to the other three Gospels. Then the sentence of death, um, uh, proclaim and then the scourging, the soldiers mocking him. This is all. This is all. Well, the earliest part is the earliest part of the Gospels of all of the Gospels, but it is told in a similar fashion, especially concerning uh, like Saint Saint Mark. We then have the the way of the cross in the usual fashion. Jesus would have had the uh, the crossbeam tied to his back. The uprights were already in place, and the uprights would have stayed there for crucifixions, um, which would have happened from time to time in the place of execution. Um, then there is the crucifixion, and then the the death of the Lord with with a loud cry. And we notice in Matthew the the veil of the temple torn right down the middle. There are various interpretations of this. One of them being that. The Holy of Holies 
is, is, it's no longer the presence of God among the people of Israel, but the, the presence of God among the people is the Lord hanging on the cross. The, but there are other interpretations of it too. And then the earthquake. The earthquake is interesting because in the ancient Jewish world, one of the references to earthquake was that it was the footsteps of God, that it was a, a sense of the presence of God. Um, and you can see why people would think such a thing, or uh, whether it be superstition or a, a reminder of how small and insignificant we are and unable to, to, to look after ourselves. We have to rely on, the, on God um, completely. And finally, the, the burial and the, the guard. That's really all I wanted to say about that, folks. I wanted to give you an idea of Palm Sunday in its, in its global position within Lent and as the great start to, to Holy Week. But as, as Roman Christians, I think we need to keep an eye on, on what Leo has to say about it, because that is, that is how we do it as Roman Christians these days that Palm Sunday is just the introduction, the palm part, the procession part. For ourselves, it also becomes an opportunity for uh, a, a preview, uh, a, a theological preview of what's going to happen on Good Friday, that we get a taste of it. And so for a reflection as we go into the great week, Holy Week, uh, uh, the greatest week of the year, that we have already anticipated the Passion by listening to one of the synoptics. And this is what Leo says about it again, just to refresh your memory. How marvelous the power of the cross. How great beyond all telling the glory of the passion. Here is the judgment seat of the Lord, the condemnation of the world, the supremacy of Christ crucified. God's compassion for us is all the more wonderful because Christ died not for the righteous or the holy, but for the wicked and the sinful. And though the divine nature could not be touched by this thing of death, he took to himself through his birth as one of us, something he could offer on our behalf. Well, I'd like to stop the, the talk there. Um, I think that's, that's enough for now. I don't know if Matt's got some comments or some questions from some of the folks that have been joining us online. Indeed, uh, we have one question here that asks, why does the Easter Vigil Mass uh, on the Saturday start so late? A good question, um, and it's something that I kind of have to legislate for every year, Matt. It's it, it, if you've ever been to Jerusalem and you 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 get there on on a Friday night or a Saturday night, there is a tradition that when three stars can be seen in the sky, the next day has begun. So it has to be that dark. That is the tradition. This is why we have things like vigil masses on a Saturday, that they're meant to be. Once it's dark, the next day has begun. And so for the Easter vigil to start, we have to kind of look at when sunset is. And we take a look at that. And of course, we don't want to be rigid about these things. We don't want to be too rigorous. We're conscious of people wanting to go home before it gets too late or too dark, and all of that. But the ancient, ancient tradition of both Jews and Christians was that the next day begins as soon as it gets dark. And a, a nice rule of thumb was to look up at the sky and see if you could see the three stars. Um, and if you've ever been to Jerusalem on a Saturday night, you know that the Sabbath is open because everybody's out having a walk and they're out having a, having a, a glass of wine or a walk with their friends or family down the street. And it's Saturday night and you're standing yeah. there saying, wait a minute, this is Saturday. I'm not meant to be having a Sabbath. But the Sabbath is over by the time the three stars are out and then you can go out to play. <laughs> yes. So we're a wee bit the same. It's it's a wee bit like that. As soon as it's kind of dark, it's time to go. Absolutely. I, I know it's in the, the liturgical calendar. It says um, <clears throat> sunset is from eight o six to eight twenty six on a Sunday. So I think it's after eight twenty six. That's when you can have it. Kind of eight o six, eight twenty six. But I know there will be some folk that will go. Well, that means eight o'clock, and that's that's okay. A little bit of epikaya, a little <laughs> bit of the the spirit of the law, because yeah. it will certainly be dark by the time they come out. Um, there'll be no don't, question. Don't clip on your priest if he starts a bit early. But there are, yeah, but there are other people um, uh, in the diocese too who like to start in the middle of the night so that they finish at dawn. 
like Hippolytus and our friends back in 235, they would they would all be getting up at the in the middle of the night if they weren't actually there doing it all night. And um, I was I once worked in Lisbon and I was at the, the the cathedral in Lisbon and it really did go on all night. Wow. Extraordinary stuff. So we were all absolutely <laughs> exhausted by the end of it. But it was also beautiful in its own way. So you know. It works, it works both ways if you've got the stamina for it. And you could do like the Easterners. Many Easterners have a way of they, they kind of drop in and drop out and drop back in again. So maybe they're away for a double espresso and then come back <laughs> for a wee bit more. I don't, I don't know. If, yeah. I'm not recommending that to folk, but there are ways and ways of doing this in our different Christian traditions. Yeah. A couple of quick fire ones. Uh, what does the word exultate mean? Exultate. It's it rejoice. It's exultare, so it's it's to rejoice, rejoice heavenly powers. That's that's all it is. That's dead easy. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, there's a comment here. Really, it's from an anonymous attendee. She said, "As a child in the north of Ireland, we celebrated the Easter vigil at midnight. So, d- does that happen in our archdiocese at all? Do you think midnight? Uh, I'm unaware of anything at midnight, but you never know. Um, I, I I know that the those who belong to the neocatechumenal way." are very fond of doing these things in at night in the dark and taking many hours and you and listening to all the readings so it depends everyone's everyone's also a bit different in that regard but but it's it's an ancient 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 beautiful tradition for those who have the stamina and the time uh, to do such things another anonymous question is ds non is a new term to me thank you does this oh. only happen during the uh, the tridium do we use it any other time that we can say? Dies non, and I, I think a dies non is is like a, a it's like a feast. A dies non. It's meant to be a day when you do no work and you don't do anything else. This is what you concentrate on. Mm. And I I don't know. It, some of some of my friends and people I come across say, "Oh, it's a dies non," it, meaning it's a day when nothing takes place. It's a non day. That's what it means. Dies is day and non is not. So it's a, a day when there's. It's a non day. It's not in. It's not there, as it were. I'm off tomorrow. I'm having a Diaz non. You're having a Diaz non. <laughs> Very good. Uh, someone's asking, where would you get a copy of Egeria's Travels on- online? Do you know if that's still available? Yes, it's still available. I've got a copy. It's on the bookshelf there. It is very interesting. You'll get it in Italian. You'll get it in Latin. You'll get it in English. I've got one in English up there that got published not so long ago. It, you go on to Abe Books or someone like that, ABE, Abe Books, you know, used books. You'll find it out there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth a look. Very interesting. Absolutely. So we're just about out of time. So I just want to okay. thank you, Your Grace, for this talk. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us as well. Our next online event is Stations of the Cross for Holy Week, and that's on Monday, the 3rd of April at 7.45. I'll just leave this up so you can take a wee photo on your phone of the registration there. But it's bit.ly forward slash stations 2023. You'll find details on our social media or on our website. Okay, this talk is recorded and will be on our YouTube channel soon. And I think that's it. So, uh, Archbishop Leo, can you please finish with a blessing? Yes, of course. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your benefits, your living reign forever and ever. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. May the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you and keep you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much. Thanks all. Good night.